Hey everybody, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to Sunday live stream. Talk about photography and a photographer. Talk about what's new. You guys have been on. I wasn't sure if I was going to stream today, so I'm sorry for the short notice. Starting actually. Might be my time going. But uh, anyhow, uh, the reason I wasn't planning today was actually going out. Uh, I'd like bird thing up loud. Was my audio popping? I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, all right, that should be better. <clears throat> so what I was saying is, um, I um, I'm planning on going out to to wildlife thing with the photo club uh, that David Crook runs, and <clears throat> I should be able to get up close and personal with some uh, some birds, right? I guess they're going to fly under their arms and <clears throat> maybe fly around. I guess they're trained to fly around. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, um, but I'm going to bring my OM1 with the 40 to 150 kit lens because I probably won't need to get too far away. But I'm, of course, I'm going to bring my 300 F4 Pro and the teleconverter, uh, you know, in case they're far out. But um, <clears throat> I think I think hopefully I'll get some good shots and I'll share those with you. So I've been trying to post some of the images here on the community tab here on YouTube so you guys can see, you know, what I've been up to and I normally post everything on Instagram, but it seems like a lot more of you are here on YouTube seeing it on my community tab. So, uh, cause not everyone does Instagram, right? Or Flickr for that matter. So I'll try and post more of the images uh, here on the community tab as well. But um, yeah, I got some great shots yesterday at the local park um, and David Crooks, uh, he got, he got the, that brand new 150 to 600 lens. <laughs> yeah, it's a monster. It's, you know, it's just like I used to have the 150 to 600 for my Nikon, you know, F mount. Uh, you know, and it's pretty much the same thing, right? It's a, it's a full frame lens uh, adapted to fit, you know, the micro four thirds. But uh, <clears throat> honestly, when you're designing a lens like that, because a lot of criticism that that lens gets is because of its size and weight, right? And why are we design using lenses designed for full frame on micro four thirds? Uh, but honestly, you, you just cannot make super telephoto lenses any smaller, right? Uh, without compromising quality, for example, or the the aperture the speed of the lens because that lens i think is an f 6.3 on the long end and it's just simple math right you have to have an entrance pupil of 95 millimeters to get an f 6.3 at 600 millimeters it's just that's just the law of physics right or whatever when they're designing lenses and uh so, you know, unless there's some radical change in lens technology and design, that's just the way it is, right? Now, I get it. There are some uh, very compact, lightweight lenses that are, uh, for example, the Nikon PF series, right? Uh, 300 millimeter F4 is significantly smaller and lighter than the 300 F4 from Olympus. And, <clears throat> you know, they're using some sort of uh, Fresnel lens technology inside. But if you look at the entrance pupil, which is somewhere inside the lens, but the front element sometimes can be a gauge of what the entrance pupil of the lens is. And the entrance pupil is basically where the aperture is, right? The aperture blades. Um, it, you know, it, the, it's, it's exactly the size it needs to be, right? It's not any bigger or any smaller. Uh, and you know, there's, there's exceptions to the lens design, right? Like super wide angle lenses have huge front elements, but they might be an F 5.6 so that in theory you could have a very tiny lens, right? 
because of the 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 amount of light that you need to let in isn't very much relatively speaking but you need to cover a very wide angle so you need to have an element that can see all the way around and that's why you got these bulbous elements on the front of these super wide angle lenses uh but i i digress um i tried out the lens i didn't try it i i mean i just he was he had it strapped to his body the the om1 with this massive lens so i just kind of held it you know like six inches away from him and it was looking through the viewfinder and yeah the magnification is pretty awesome uh so i um i <laughs> it's tempting but i'm i'm very content with the 300 f4 because i know i you know that's a known quantity it's probably uh the best 300 millimeter f4 on the market regardless of mount in my opinion uh Obviously, I haven't tried them all or any other lenses for that matter, but I can tell you that the, the kind of results that I'm getting with a 300 millimeter f4 are just outstanding. And then you throw on the 1.4 teleconverter and you get uh, a 420 millimeter reach. And that's good enough for my purposes, more than good enough for most people, I would think. But some of us want 600 millimeters, right? Plus a teleconverter on top of that. Uh, but I do want to. Um, uh caution everyone when you're looking at super telephoto lenses uh for our micro four thirds cameras 16 or 20 megapixels uh you really don't want to go you really don't want to shoot beyond f8 uh, because of diffraction i mean the simplest way to put it is diffraction starts to set in and that's going to offset any gains you have in uh uh sharpness or depth of field so try try to stay at f8 and under and that's assuming it's a perfect lens and as as i you know i've come to learn over time that the micro four third lenses from olympus and panasonic for that matter uh optically they're excellent so really you need to need to control your settings to optimize the performance of that lens uh to get the best image so stay at f8 and under to minimize the diffraction if you can be at f5 6 all the better if your lens allows it but 600 millimeter at 6.3 shoot that lens wide open you could go to f8 but you risk diffraction particularly uh you know with a very high density uh pixel pitch in terms of pixel pitch are very high density sensors and I guess that's another topic that uh, really doesn't get covered much is, you know, the 20 megapixels on a micro four thirds is not the same as 20 megapixels on, you know, any other format, APS-C or full frame, medium format, whatever, uh, <clears throat> in terms of detail. Now, in terms of light gathering, right because each pixel is bigger on the bigger size you go on the format that's a different matter and there's also a uh, light flux and resolution i mean i've been studying lens design on and off for about a year now trying to understand the technology and relationship of our lenses with our sensors <clears throat> so i'm just i'm just spewing out you know what's off the top of my head don't don't take everything. I always do your due diligence, especially if you hear it on YouTube. Always do your due diligence and make sure, uh, you know. But anyhow, uh, I was getting into pixel pitch, <clears throat> and you know, the twenty megapixels you get you get so much detail because we have a very small pixel pitch on our micro four thirds cameras at twenty megapixels. And there is a there is a lot of desire to go to 25 or even higher number of megapixels on our micro four thirds sensors, uh, but that's always going to have compromises. Not just the low light gathering ability, right? Which, you know, if you get enough light, you'll be okay, uh, regardless of pixel pitch. Almost, uh, you know, look at any cell phone camera, and it's a testament to what you can do with very very tiny pixels in good light right it's just when you start to get into low light is when cell phones and and very small sensor cameras fall apart but i'm talking about detail and you know if you attach a very high quality lens to a very high 
uh, dense pixel dense sensor, you're going to get more detail out of it. Uh, so that, that's why I think our, our micro four thirds camera is not just because of the overall size and weight of the system, you know, this new lens aside, right? Um, we we tend to get more detail in macro photography and wildlife photography with the same 20 megapixels of any other camera. Um, now, there is that cropping ability, say, like my Sony a7R5 has 60 megapixels. I don't know why I'm getting into this megapixel thing. But, <clears throat> uh, you know, I can crop in quite a bit and still get really good detail. And in fact, I, I shoot in APS-C mode on my a7R5 time to time because I just I just don't need 60 megapixels, right? Uh, I'd rather shoot at 24 megapixels, uh, which is the APS-C mode. But uh, yeah, I think I think there's so many advantages, and I wanted to get to some of the comments uh, to the micro four third systems that go way beyond just uh, you know the size and weight of the system, right? The higher pixel density gives us better resolution on macro and wildlife and telephoto. Uh, the um, <clears throat> and then the quality of lenses that are available to us at reasonable reasonable prices. You know, they're, they're the exceptions, right? The pro lenses, weather sealed, all of that. But uh, generally speaking, you can get into a micro four third system, uh, particularly if you're looking secondhand. But even if you're looking at like the EM10 Mark IV with a couple of kit lenses, you're getting such a great little camera very capable and it's going to really do everything anyone would ever want to ever really need to do and i can say that in my case because i switched professionally to micro four thirds right from a nikon full frame system because i wanted the smaller lightweight lenses and it there, there was a very low entry cost entry to get in because an em i started with an em 10 mark ii that was my first camera that i started using professionally i got into micro four thirds very cheaply and it replaced my very expensive nikon full frame gear uh while no loss in image quality and uh certainly a much lighter package to take out into the field with me so <clears throat> The, in other words, micro four thirds for me is still extremely relevant and extremely capable for everything I want need to do. Like if I want to do my work professionally, or if I want to go out and do birding and wildlife, or if I want to do macro photography or do portrait photography, whatever it is I want to do or anything anyone would ever want to do with a micro four thirds camera, you can do, right? Uh, and do it well. So. That's why I'm such a big fanboy of Micro Four Thirds. Is it's just it just constantly doesn't get any FaceTime <clears throat> on YouTube like it deserves, in my opinion. You know, <clears throat> only recently has uh, a couple of channels like Tony and Chelsea have, have mentioned or talked about Micro Four Thirds a little bit lately. Uh, Fro, he's out. He's never he's never going to look at Micro Four Thirds again. But that's okay. I still like Pro, uh, and so on and so on. And then I just saw in the comments, uh, Roberto, how you doing? Uh, that Kai did a good video this week on nine. I think it was nine reasons to do micro four thirds. I watched a little bit of that yesterday, <laughs> and um, yeah, it was okay. Uh, <clears throat> I I didn't think he did a very convincing job for people that might be interested in micro four thirds. Uh, other than his his uh, overall presence on YouTube and being the celebrity he is, quote unquote, giving credence to the Micro Four Thirds system, I think that is a bigger deal than anything he said in a video. Because everyone generally knows it's a smaller, lightweight system. It's a well flushed out, mature uh, lens selection. Has all the features and capabilities. Uh, excellent image stabilization. You know all of the normal tropes that you hear about why you would want to get into micro four thirds but in the real world that you and i live in right it really works and it does a great job and it's never disappointed me um so 
I, I can say that OM Systems Olympus, because that's been my primary brand, has uh, never disappointed me. I've always been extremely happy with the results that I get from that system, the kind of things I can do with it that I can't do on any other system, right? Uh, only recently has some of the other cameras started to implement uh, the features that we find in our Micro Four Thirds cameras, but they don't do it as well. The execution is very, very poor. They still have a ways to go. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the technology that you're starting to see in, in other other manufacturers, you know, Sony, Nikon, Canon, et cetera, uh, isn't licensed from OM Systems or Olympus directly, right? Uh, I don't know. You know, that's, that's all proprietary... Uh, trade secret type stuff that nobody really knows. Uh, <clears throat> but I can only guess, right? So that said, let me catch up in the chat. So I see Roberto's here. How you doing? Bernie, good to see you. Uh, he says, uh, I'm okay with larger lenses. Cool. Um, as we still have compact lenses are providing similar reach, it's great to have options. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I need to figure out how to bring up my chat window. There we go. Marco, good morning. Good to see you. And Marco, always good to see you. How's that lens coming along? I know you got the, the 150 to 600. Uh, <clears throat> and hopefully my audio is OK now. I saw a couple of uh, comments earlier. Let me know if the audio is good now. I, I had the noise filter or noise uh, gate turned on my mic because I was doing the uh, live stream guest live stream last week. And uh, Marco says, I was messing with the 150 to 600 and MC20 to shoot the moon. And if you actually have, you actually zoom out a bit if you capture video because the moon was larger than, oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, Bernie. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, M43 just makes sense. It just it just makes so much sense. Um, and then Roger, good to see you. It says, uh, great wildlife photos. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I got those. I caught those yesterday morning uh, with the photo club. And, you know, yeah, there was some there was some good, good uh, opportunities. I was trying to get a swallow so hard, but I'm a little out of practice because this is really the first time I've been out in the spring. I think the last time I took my 300 F4 out was when I went to shoot the Eagles in Conowingo, and uh, <clears throat> that was months ago, right? So I haven't been out with my 300 F4 in a while. So it's, you know, you have to kind of get, you know, I've gotten really good at like seeing a bird and then being able to pull the lens up and target it, get it in the frame and start shooting it. But I was a little out of practice. I was getting there towards the end, but uh, I was still struggling a bit. So. Uh, over over time, like the next uh, few weeks, I should be back in the true form of spotting the bird in the sky, then pulling the camera up and getting it in the frame and start shooting right away. Swallows are, you know, these little tiny birds, and they fly like a million out, you know, really fast. Uh, God, there was such a great little fight going on or or mating. I don't know what these two swallows were just going at it in the middle middle of the the sky, right? And I was like, oh, my God, I'm trying to get it. And I got it in frame and then they'd move. And then and then the autofocus just I lost it, you know, because that's the other thing is. Uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of background, so sometimes the autofocus would just move to the background <laughs> uh, when when I lost the birds out of the frame it would go to the background. So I need to adjust my settings and stuff so it doesn't do that quite as much. Uh, I would just turn the sensitivity down. Um, but that, you know, that, that I got, I got to work with it a little bit, uh, but I'll, I'll get there anyway. Um, oh, David Teller. Good to see you. I saw David yesterday in the, in the meetup and he just got the new, uh, not new. He just got, uh, the 12 to 100 F4 to go traveling with. So I look forward to seeing the, the images that you get from that, uh, when you go on your trip. Um, 
Let's see, Marco has some. The pixel size on a larger sensor is not always larger. Pixel density varies based on... Yeah, yeah, that... I, I should have clarified that a little more. Assuming you have 20 megapixels, you know, sensor to sensor, right? From small to large, the pixels get bigger. If you have the same number of megapixels on a full frame, you're going to have much bigger pixels than you will on a 20 megapixel. The pix pixel density will be a lot uh, denser on micro four thirds and it will be on full frame given the same well let's see and and you know there's there's a lot of uh i think credence to even if you have very tiny pixels 60 megapixels and you you downsize those to 20 megapixels ultimately you will get the same uh noise performance as a lower megapixel full frame camera, right? But <clears throat> honestly, we can talk about the technical aspects and dynamic range and, and noise performance and you know all of this other stuff to death, right? I'm not prepared for that today, obviously, but uh, ultimately those things don't improve your photography, right? I mean it's 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 the same same thing we keep we have to keep reminding ourselves at least i have to keep reminding myself that these things are not going to improve my photography right i got i got my fuji my sony my olympus uh all these different brand cameras of varying you know sensor sizes and resolution my photography hasn't changed at all right it's just what am i using to capture the world around me in that moment right uh, none of these things technically have improved my photography. They, some of the things have made things easier with the Olympus, right? The, the subject detect is awesome. It's really enabled me to get out there and do birding uh, and enjoy that a lot more. <laughs> um, and uh, the focus stacking is awesome and, and the high res shot mode. It's enabled me to do a lot of things that... Uh, I wouldn't be able to do otherwise, but these are just tools, right? They're not necessarily improving my photography. Uh, it, so <clears throat> I, I always have to remind myself because I, I start taking these deep dives into camera specs sometimes when I'm, you know, I'm looking at stuff online all the time. And, and, and I'll, I'll get into it because academically, it's very, very interesting. And the conversation, this, this is purely academic when it comes to photography, because photography in of itself, really, to when, when I try to think about photography, it's really about what are you capturing? You know, uh, what are the images you're capturing? Are you capturing interesting images or whatever? Or are you just having fun, right? Um, maybe, maybe gear is fun, having all the latest gadgets right uh can make can make photography fun too so that's fine but uh i wanted to talk about this camera because i, I might do a video on this i don't know but i picked this up this is the lumix uh, lx5 and uh, i don't know why i got to bug up my butt about compact cameras but you know a week or two ago i just I just was shopping compact cameras all of a sudden. And uh, after all my due diligence, um, I landed on the Panasonic LX5. Uh, and I, I gotta tell you, I'm really impressed with this little camera and with respect to its image quality. Now the camera by itself, the image quality is just okay. Right, but when I put it through DxO, uh, and I'm not talking about noise reduction, I'm talking about just processing with DxO and applying the D prime. Um, the images I get from this are just outstanding. But I, I credit a lot of that to using DxO. Right, it's my favorite photo editing processor because uh, the straight out of camera JPEGs and everything are about what you would expect from like an old camera like this, right? 10 megapixels and just keep the ISOs low. But what really makes this camera stand out is this F2 Leica lens in it. It's, it's amazingly sharp uh, for such a tiny, tiny little camera. And, 
my XZ2, this camera also surprised me right when I got it. And this is a superior camera to this in every single way. I mean, it's got the, the tilty screen on the back. It's got a faster lens and a higher quality lens, in my opinion. I think the images are sharper. It also has better uh, image processing. So the images that come out of this are actually better than this one in, in every, every single way. <clears throat> so if I was just kind of a gearhead, I would not use this camera at all. I would say, I'm going to use this one. All right, because this is just just technically better. Uh, but this is this is it's hard to tell on camera, but this is substantially smaller and lighter and a little bit more fun to take out. The, the biggest limitation I'm having with this is because it doesn't have the tilty screen. It's really hard to get the low shots, right? Uh, I have to take a couple like just kind of eyeball it and take a couple down low <clears throat> to get them. But if you look at some of uh, the images, I guess I could share a couple. Let me see. Um, nothing earth shattering, but how can I pull? I I'm trying to find where's the share screen? Share screen window. It's that one. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, I mean, this is this is not a great image, right? But um, why did that disappear? Share screen window. All right, let me let me try it again. I don't know why that that disappeared. All right, so this this one, not nothing fancy, right? It's just a marina I went to, uh, but I t when I when I look at this image closely, I don't know if I can get in there. This is a 10 megapixel camera, and there's certainly more than enough detail here. If I wanted to crop into this part here, or just back out and look at it this way. Um, let me see what else is in here. This is another image I took uh, while I was out. This is where I took the bird pictures yesterday, at, along with like 100 other people, right? <laughs> so my images aren't particularly unique. Um, let me see. OM1, OM1, OM1. Here, here's one I took with this camera. <clears throat> so, you know, this, this camera, I'm getting great, great color out of it. You know, the colors are nice and rich. Uh, and the detail is amazing from this lens. And the camera is, is pretty responsive. Uh, you know, it's it it's it's slow by today's standards, but for the most part, um, it's doing a good job. Let's see. Here's here's one. <laughs> My nephew. <laughs> um, where's another one? This was some practice stuff. This this image here. <clears throat> this is from a little thirty dollar point and shoot camera I bought. I, I got to return that thing. This thing is, but 30 bucks. And this thing still is not bad. But again, I, I attribute a lot of that to the processing I do in DxO. You know, here's another one. $30, $30 camera, right? Uh, it's really, really not very good. But it, it's a kid's camera. It's not, not anything special. This, this, this is my uh, Halo shot from yesterday. This, this is my favorite shot that I took with the OM-1, the 300 f4 with the teleconverter. Uh, I have this on my Flickr page if you want to pixel peep it. But yeah, it's it's pretty good. <laughs> um, I'm really happy with how this came out. Okay, so let me, let me 
me see how do I get my mouse back over so there, there's a few things but yeah this 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 camera I paid 150 bucks for it which is it's not bad uh I guess I got what I paid for I see it sell for a lot higher of course they're in better condition than this one is but um it's ridiculous how much these stupid things cost now these things this should be like a 50 dollar camera right this should not cost 150 certainly not 250 like a lot of people are asking for this same thing with the xc2 this should be a hundred dollar camera not 250 and and the kind of prices people are asking for these things it's just crazy hopefully that this 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 trend will go down a little bit and people stop driving up the prices on these because it's just stupid i I, I guess I should be happy in one sense that that there's demand for photography products, right? That that people aren't, you know, just going to use their cell phone. They want a real camera. <clears throat> On the other hand, it's kind of messing me up here because I want to I want to try some other small cameras, you know. Uh, but I'll, I'll have to I'll have to talk about my my decision process and and on why I chose these specific compact cameras. I got this one. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this. It's a kid's camera, but it 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 prints out onto the, this. Let me see if this will focus. Like this thermal paper, like you get your receipts on at the store. So it's it's like pennies per print, and of course it's only black and white because it's thermal paper, right? But it's just just pennies per print to do this instead of like paying a dollar or more per print for Polaroids and other types of instant cameras. Uh, all right, let me let me show you the camera. This is a cool camera. I'm keeping this one, I think. I think I'm keeping this one. <clears throat> but this this is it here. It's just it's just a little little thermal camera. Let me turn it on. It's got it's got video games on it, so I was playing Tetris on this. Uh, where's the power, oh, power buttons on the back? It has Tetris, <laughs> so it, it's turning on. You know, like thirty bucks. It's got a it's got a real screen. It's not live view or anything, but so now I have the camera on. Of course, it's it, it's too you know. Of course, I'm not going to be able to focus on this, right? But see, there's my eye. So it has live view. And then if I take a picture, watch. It'll start to start to print out. It's really amazing. So there's a picture of what I'm looking at, right? And then you just tear it off like a receipt. Oh, man, I accidentally hit the button, print button. But... All right, focus, 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 focus. There. Isn't that cool? Look at that. I, it just, I accidentally hit the uh, shutter button. And I don't sweat it because it's like pennies per print. <laughs> uh, so I think for a little kid, it would be a lot of fun and very relieving to parents if they're not paying a dollar a print, right? And you can you can just go on almost forever with this this little thermal thing. I might take it out to the uh, how does this open again? I forget. Yeah, so yeah, it's just little little receipt paper, thermal thermal receipt paper, and it goes inside here, and. That's that's the most fun I've had with a camera in a long time. <laughs> and I, you know, I did all of these. Well, you know, this is I don't know how many pictures. There's like 20 pictures. This would be 20 bucks on any other camera, right? Instant camera. So, and and it saves the images to an SD card. They suck, okay? They're really bad. It's like one megapixel or some ridiculous low resolution. They claim 16 megapixels, but that's BS. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, 
anyhow it's it's a it's a cool little camera um so let me let me let me go back up to the catch here or chat so let's see i'm working on getting a 12 megapixel camera i really want the lx100 for travel shots with family i'm trying hard to save up for it. yeah they're going for like 400 dollars and or 450 i could have got one for 400 bucks i was looking at those too uh but after i got this um i was like i don't really need the alex 100 now uh if and then i was looking at the stylus 1s uh that's an awesome camera i would love to get one I'm going to start shopping those. That's probably going to be next on my bucket list of cameras to get is the Stylus 1S. Uh, because what it has that this doesn't, of course, is the super zoom. It has the tilt screen, the 1S, and uh, an EVF. That's the key thing. And the lens on that Stylus 1S, it's a, a 24 to 300, whatever it is. You know, it's a super zoom at f2.8 constant all the way through. So it's not going to suffer the same problems I'm having with my other compact super zoom. Um, <clears throat> this this one here, this this little beauty, I love. This reminds me of the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica. This little beauty here, uh, this is the Olympus SZ30 MR. Don't get this one though. Get the 31 SZ31 MR. It's a much better camera uh, in some ways. But um, this has a like a 28 to 300 equivalent, whatever it is. But the problem is, is it starts at f3.3 or something, or f3, and it goes to f6.9. And the problem is diffraction starts to set in because the pixel density on this is so high. Because uh, it's a 16 megapixel, 1 over 2.3 sensor. Diffraction starts to set in like at f2.8. Like at f2.8, you're okay. But at f4, uh, you're definitely going to start to see a little bit of softness. And then when you zoom this out to f, or zoom this all the way out to 300 millimeters, um the the images are very soft because diffraction is so bad on this and that's why the stylus 1s <clears throat> and i looked at some sample images when it's extended out to 300 millimeters it's f 2.8 all the way out to 300 millimeters so that lens is really sharp even at the long end because it's not fighting diffraction on the long end like this camera is this camera no matter how good the sensor is um, you know, the fact that this is f6.9 on the long end, uh, it's just going to be soft. It's going to be soft no matter what. Um, and you'd have to heavily process them and you're going to lose details. It's just not happening on this. So I wouldn't get this for the super zoom capability. I've taken a few shots with this and they suck on the long end. On the wide end, it's nice. It actually takes pretty nice pictures. But the problem is, this is using the older processor. So there's a lot of compression going on in the JPEGs and noise reduction. So uh, a lot of the details are lost because of the way they're processing the J JPEGs. And this doesn't shoot raw, unfortunately. So I think this this is going to be a shelf piece. I, I just don't see myself really using this that much, if at all. Because the image quality is just not great. It's fine for just a point and shoot camera if you want to go out and have some fun. But when I have, you know, something, whoops, something like this, you know, it, there's no reason to take this out. Or, you know, especially having this, which is amazing, this camera. But yeah, the LX100. Uh, versus, say, maybe some people might be considering the LX100 version 2. I, I think you're fine with either camera. Uh, the image quality coming out of both seem to be very, very close. Um, 
Yeah, David Tellett has the LX100 version too. I, I shot with it a little bit one time when he brought it with him. It's really nice. It's so nice. It's so tempting. I I wanted I was I was thinking about asking if you want to sell it. <laughs> but I I don't know. I don't know. Uh I, I kind of miss having this tilt screen. If I'm gonna get a higher quality camera, say, than this LX5, right? It's going to, you know, the XZ2 is that camera. This is a higher quality camera, but it doesn't have the EVF, which, you know, my dying eyes, I got to have an EVF. I can't really see the back of the screen too well. Uh, my arms just aren't long enough. And even if they were, then it would be too far away to read anyway, right? So having an EVF will help me to set the settings and also the pixel peep to make sure I, I nailed focus and all that. <clears throat> Anyhow, um, oh, Tan has the Stylus 1S and use it. It's great fun to use, and the pictures are fine. Nowadays, I use more. And in RAW with DxO, it's top. Yeah. DxO will take any camera just about that shoots RAW and bring it next level. It just, I, I am just always amazed at the kind of processing I get through DxO. I use Photolab 7, which has the D Prime. Uh, but DxO Pure Raw, which I, I need to, to review. I downloaded the trial, and I'm going to try and uh, and do a review or tutorial on it uh, because it has some new features on it. I'm not sure if I want to buy it or if I'm gonna, I'm, I want to. I don't need to buy because I have PhotoLab 7. That's why I just downloaded the trial to see what it's like. <clears throat> I, I, I assume if I call DX or email DxO, they'll send me a license for it. But my trial runs out this week because I downloaded it last week. It's only a two-week trial. So I'm going to have to hurry up. If I don't hurry up, then I'll have to email them and see if they'll give me a license for it. But um, anyhow, uh, question to all, if I want to capture the inside of a flower, how do I get 100% clarity? I shot my 90 millimeter at 1.4 at f14 and still... Oh, okay. Yeah, you have to you have to do focus stacking, Eric. There's just no way around it. The depth of field at those short distances, you know, it's too shallow. And if you try to shoot at even higher apertures, then diffraction starts to set in. So you have to you have to focus stack. No, no way around it. Yeah, I thought about getting the VF4, right? The 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 what he what Joe is talking about is the uh cuz this one will use it too. This one has a, a EVF thing. I was thinking about doing that, right? Uh getting the VF4, but then I was thinking for a little more I can just get a stylus 1S. Uh so it's a tough call cuz I've I've seen the VF4 for 150 bucks and I'm like, wow. And I've seen it combined with other cameras, like it'll come with like an EPL one or whatever it is that the VF4 is compatible with, uh, for about three hundred. And I'm thinking, why don't I just get a Stylus One S instead? So yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough call. I thought about it. I saw a combo package for about two hundred dollars included a PL one and a VF two, which I think works with this. I thought about it. And good evening, Paul. Good to see you. Um, and let's see. You have the Stylus 1S, David? Man, you got to let me borrow that. Oh, my God. I got to borrow, sell it to me. Man, I would love, I would love to have that camera. Um... Man, you got a stylus 1S and didn't tell nobody. But yeah, the reason that lens, you know, they did a really good job designing the lens on the stylus 1S. It's optically excellent. And the fact that it stays at f2.8 all the way out, it's not it's not because of the light gathering. That's that's sort of a side benefit. The main benefit of having a constant f2.8 is you're well under the the uh diffraction threshold on that sensor. So Definitely, because the fraction sets in based on pixel pitch, right? 
And if you have very, very dense pixel, if you have a high pixel density, uh, you're gonna ha you're more susceptible to diffraction. Uh, so it's not sensor size, it's it's pixel density that really affects uh, when diffraction can set in. And that's the other challenge with coming out with a 33 or 40 megapixel micro four thirds sensor is you got to keep your apertures low to avoid diffraction, assuming the lens is already optically perfect. Because a lot of lenses, right, you're shooting wide open at f1.4 or 1.8, and the lens is soft, right? The fraction is not the problem. It's just optically the lens is a little bit soft wide open. <clears throat> so sometimes you have to balance, right? Do I stop the lens down to f4 where or f5.6 where the peak sharpness is? And then is that going to be below the diffraction limit of my sensor? So there's this balance, right? <clears throat> and when you're talking about little compact cameras, the, the Stylus 1S has a 1 over 1.7, I think, sensor in it with 12 megapixels. So the pixel density is still high, but it's not as high as, say, uh, some other compact cameras like, like this one. This one has an extremely high pixel density. It, it has a higher threshold for diffraction. So the lens, if they design an optically uh, superior lens and can keep the aperture down at f2.8, that's why that, that camera, like David Tellett says, punches well above its weight. And, you know, I'm, av after I get my copy, I'm going to do a video on it. <laughs> I don't want to make a video on it now because I don't have the camera and I don't want to drive the prices up even more because that camera is ridiculously expensive. Yeah, see, Roberto's talent saying it's five hundred dollars. It's crazy, uh, and that's Australian dollars. But still, in the here in the U.S., I'm not seeing it for for much below three hundred. Not very often, three hundred bucks U.S. Um, oh, David's here. How you doing, David? I'm gonna have to try out your one fifty to six hundred today. When we, David and I are going out to that wildlife thing today, so I need to I need to head out here in about thirty minutes. Um, yeah, buy it. I I should. I should. I have it on my eBay list. Let me see if it's still there. It might have sold. I had a I had one on my eBay watch list for like 280 bucks. Um Yeah, it's gone. There's one here. Um Let's see, screen. Yeah, there's there's this one here, which I was looking at. Um, relatively low shutter count, 1600. But 280 bucks, uh, free shipping from within the US. What else? I don't know. Um, I'm... Uh, Yeah, that looks good. I mean, this looks like a good deal to me. Comes with the original charger and, and I don't know, maybe the original battery. And it uses the same battery, I think, as my EM5s and EM10s, so I'll be good there. So that, that looks really good to me. I, I really like that. Um, let's see. Yeah, you're tempted, right? I would I would wait until the jury's fully out on that though, because uh, you can get a 300 f4 for the same price, right? And I know the 300 f4. <laughs> that's why I'm not even really seriously considering the 150 to 600 because I know how good the 300 f4 is. And you tack on the one point, and I think you have the 300 f4 already, right? So you know what I'm talking about, how good that lens is. Um, but it is tempting. And Jim Jones, good morning. Good morning from Kansas. Um, Jeff Painter, hey, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. Harder than finding the Stylus 1S was finding the Olympus leather case. Oh, really? The same seller also sold me the case for the XZ1. Sometimes, yeah, I know. It's, it's nice when you can kind of get things bundled together with it. 
but it's tricky, right? You have to be very patient because sometimes you'll see like everything you want bundled together, like the auto lens cap and the leather case and maybe even a separate uh, bag, like small carry bag for it. But then the camera itself is like in poor condition, right? But you get all these accessories. So I was looking at, okay, so I'm going to buy a parts only camera or a piece of crap version of it because it has all the accessories included and then try and find a mint copy of the camera itself, right? And then sell off the junk camera. And then I'll have, you know, you have to buy two of everything to get everything to come together, I guess. I don't know. It, it There's the, you know, God, you know, I just have too much time on my hands, maybe. I, I got to stop, stop doing things like that. And Tom says he just picked up something. Let me see. So I just picked up the EPM2. Oh, wow, for 150 bucks. And then DxO ranks dynamic range at 12.2 and the M1 Mark II at 12.8. Now I'm looking at the EV4. So should be a good camera. Do you, I don't know much about it. Uh, let me just look at it real quick. I mean, I have a general feel for EPM2. Um, this was a... Let me go to share screen. So this was a um, EPM2, let's see what DP review. Thank goodness this is still around. I still go to it time to time. So came out, or this review was done in 2013. And uh, 16 megapixel sensor and TruePix 6 processor, okay. Looks awesome. And then which, what's the uh, focus points on this? Where are the specs? So basically what we're looking at, if this has like the 70 or 80 point AF system, oh, 35, okay. So this has a little bit weaker AF system. I mean, the contrast detect is fine. Uh, but it got a little better, I think, with the TruePix 7 in the EM, like in my EM10 Mark II, where it has like 78 or 80 points instead of 35. But you know, the TruePix 6 introduced all of these um, scene modes and art filters and stuff. Wow, eight frame per second continuous drive. That's pretty good. And then it's uh, 300, 269 gram, grams. Wow, it's tiny. 110 by 64 by 34. So it's, about this, it's probably smaller than the Stylus 1S uh, body only, right? This looks really good, man. Um, you got a great deal on it, I think. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't, you're not going to have any regrets with that, that camera. I would, I would say it's awesome. I mean, this is the thing is like when you got technically superior cameras like this EPM2 over, say, um, you know, something like this, I it just boggles my mind. I don't know. And a lot of digicams, there are a lot of digicams are crap that are selling for more than this EPM2. And this EPM2 will give you much better uh, performance. You know, obviously the lens selection is awesome. And uh, it's just a better camera in every single way than a lot of these digicams that are selling for outrageous prices. Oh. Yeah, the 300 F4 is amazing with the 1.4 teleconverters, but imagine 600 with a 1.4. Well, David Crooks has the 1.4 teleconverter. Uh, he needs to clean it though. I'm always ragging on him about cleaning his lenses. My God, the guy, I don't know why, but every time I borrow something like, oh, do you have, can I borrow that lens? Or can I, you know, whenever we go out together, I'm like, his lenses are just, I have to clean them every time before I put them on my camera. I mean, I'm not a neat freak or, or fanatic about keeping my lenses clean, but, um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want it to look like it was just 
you know, anyway. Dave's Dave's a great guy though. Dave's a great guy and works really hard at the photo club. I really appreciate it. Running running a photo club is not an easy thing. Um uh, And then, Rob, with the Canon 200 800 full frame lens coming up for 1900 and the Canon R62 for 2600, is it time to switch to full frame to get much better image quality for a comparable price? Um, well, this goes back to uh, my conversation about you know, the pixel density. I think the R62 is a 26 or 33 megapixel, I forget what it is. And with an 800 millimeter lens, um, that's really good reach on a full frame camera. So the question is, uh, let me see what, I think you're gonna be okay though. Canon 200 to 800. It's an F uh, 6.3. Oh, it goes to F9 on the long end. All right. Um, let me Let me show you my, my logic here. So <clears throat> this is uh oh Abe's of Maine. <laughs> that's pro that's got to be. Let's let's go to Adorama, like an, a a legitimate dealer. <clears throat> Abe's of Maine is great, but they they're not a authorized dealer. So nineteen hundred bucks, right? Uh, and then um, let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. You guys can't see my screen. Give me one second. Let's talk. Let's, because this is this is a constant conversation, constant debate, right? Should I go full frame at a, at roughly the same cost? Albeit there's some compromises. F9 is is pretty dark, right? But <clears throat> that's offset by you're getting four times the light gathering of a full frame sensor, technically, right? Oops. I got to make sure. I don't know why I got a message. Anyway, I do need to head out soon. Let me let me hide this for for a second and then see if I can bring up my other uh, photography diffraction. And the R6 Mark II, I forget how many megapixels dash. Um, yeah, hey Robin, how are you? Yeah, just a little bit earlier, and I have to leave a little bit earlier. Okay, so the R6 is a 24 megapixel sensor. All right, and so let me put into. Uh, let me share my screen now because I want to show you guys kind of my my thing here, right? So let's do a Canon. Let's see what do they have in here. 70s. Those are 60s. That's a full frame. What's the newest? EOS R. I guess the closest thing would be like this 60 or 5D. All right, so 5D. And it's it's probably really 25 megapixels overall, right? Cuz they it's effectively 24, but there's usually a little bit of overhead. Uh so the fraction sets in at f11. Okay. So you're okay. So this initial thought of see this f9? So if you're zoomed out at 800 millimeters you're still within, you, you haven't breached that diffraction threshold with this particular camera and lens combination. So that's number one. Uh, could, just to give you an example, if we switch to say the R6 or R5, I think that's a 45 mega, let's say 46. Um, you can see that the fraction limit is right at F9 on that camera, right? Because it's uh, a higher pixel density. And if you go to 
an Olympus, just we'll pick one here, GX7, any any micro four thirds. And 20 megapixels. You can see we're at f5.6 is the diffraction limit. But if if we were to make a 33 megapixel micro four thirds, you can see the diffraction limit's closer to f4. And then 40 megapixels, we're definitely at f4. So this is a problem for micro four thirds. When you have too many pixels, uh, even if you have the optically perfect lens, um, you cannot get around diffraction. And if you're going to shoot at higher than f4 on a micro four thirds with 40 megapixels, your images are going to be soft. Uh, anyhow, so back to this. Uh, why is this? Why is this not showing? Okay. So what I was saying is we're at F9. So diffraction on the R6 Mark II sets in at F11. You're at F9. And th this is the biggest problem, though, is you could get the uh, 300 F4 with a... 1.4 tally converter, and that'll put you in the same range as this. You're at f5.6. So you're, you're, that's one stop plus another third, roughly. So you're one and a third stop faster with the OM1 and 300 f4. And you're at, you're at a fraction of the size and weight, right? Um, what does this thing weigh? Two kilos. Wow. Okay, so all right, this is this is my thought on this. To to your original question. Um, <clears throat> assuming the R6 Mark II can perform as well as say the, the OM1 with the subject detect for birding. And I assume we're talking about birding, right? Why else would you know wildlife? Because why else would you get an 800 millimeter lens? Um, it's a tough call. If you don't have any problem with the size and weight of that lens being at two kilos and the overall length, it's going to be fairly long. It's not a huge lens because it's F9, right? They don't have to make the ending too big. Uh, the, the entrance pupil too large at F9 on the long end. Um, I, I'd say it's a pretty even match between the R6 Mark II and the OM-1 with the 300 F4. <clears throat> it's pretty evenly matched in terms of performance and op optical quality. The only thing is that F9, you're going to have to be shooting at much slower shutter speeds or higher ISO. So when you're shooting, at, you're, if you're at 800 millimeters at F9, uh, you could be, say, at ISO 1600, right? Then on a micro four thirds, you could be shooting at ISO, say, 400. <laughs> because it's a one and a third stop faster. Well, not 400, but uh, let's say 500. You could be shooting a much lower ISO on the micro four thirds. So any gain you really get in the full frame system in terms of image quality and noise performance is kind of offset by the faster aperture of the micro four thirds system. Um, you know, and I'm I'm assuming the 300 f4 with the teleconverter, the 1.4 teleconverter, right? So we're at f5.6. Um, so I I think I think it's just whatever. I think if you're already in the Canon RF system, it makes sense to go that route, right? Because you don't have to reinvest in everything else. Because you're not going to use an R6 Mark II just for wildlife, right? Most of us are going to buy one camera system and flush out the lenses for that. <clears throat> if you already have the OM Micro Four Thirds system and your lens lens system is already flushed out, I mean, you got your two primes, you got a couple kit lenses, a couple of, you know, you have a nice setup for your Micro Four Thirds. I don't see any reason to switch to Canon um, when you can get a 300 F4 used or, you know, whatever lenses for the Micro Four Thirds system and get equivalent performance in terms of you know, subject acquisition and image quality. I think if, you know, the there, there's certain opportunity cost 
if you do, because you're going to lose money if you switch systems, or if you add a, add this system to your existing one, you're going to spend a lot of money. Um, I think that money would be better spent staying in one system and using that money either for better glass or for going to workshops and adventures, you know, things like that, traveling to locations where you can get better images. Because again, getting the full frame system is not going to improve your photography, right? Getting a different system or different camera and different lens. What's going to improve your photography is, is ultimately you and your skill set and developing that and the locations you can go to, all of that good stuff, right? Uh, so my the, the short answer is I, I don't see a need to switch uh, to that particular setup. You know, money, no object, you know, yeah, you can you can go crazy. But uh, with with those with that setup, the RF two hundred to eight hundred, seeing that it's an F nine, doesn't make sense to me uh, because it's just the the you're just gonna have to shoot at too high of an ISO or too slow of a shutter speed to uh, really capture birds in flight, uh, in my opinion. Okay. Um, <laughs> Wayne. 5D classic, yeah. And Ali 100 to 400. That's true. The 100 to 400, and I think that's also an F6.3. Uh, it's half the weight and cost, right? Or maybe not half the cost, but it's, you know, it's certainly more affordable. The Olympus 100 to 400. I keep forgetting about that lens because it's been off my radar uh, since I got my 300 F4. Um, but yeah, that's certainly a viable option to this Canon 200 to 800 is the, the Olympus 100 to 400. And I think you also have to think about, is it full frame lower model versus top of the line system? You might be shooting with all the needed lenses. Yeah, I, yeah. the R6 Mark II though, I think is definitely a comparable to the OM-1 with respect to features and, and all of that. Uh, certainly, uh, image quality is going to be very good because it's, it's a very low pixel density, full frame sensor. And it's it's about the same price, maybe a little cheaper, you know, depending on the moon phase and all of that. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, ultimately, the problem with full frame systems is the, the, the lenses just get huge, ultimately right uh yeah there's a lot of compact prime options and compact zoom options but you sacrifice you're going to sacrifice something like like thomas isel said there's no free lunch right if you're going to get the same size lens with the same focal length maybe even the same aperture on a full frame camera as a micro four thirds uh there's going to be a compromise somewhere um so keep that in mind um and Bob says, aren't you going to have focus problems at F9? And then, yeah, that's true, right? So you're getting a lot less light into the focusing system for the camera to be able to detect subjects and objects. That's a very good point. Um, as the light starts to drop, right? So you're going to have to use that camera and lens system in optimal lighting situations where it's going to be relatively bright uh, during the day. As the light starts to drop, I mean, I'm not talking even twilight. I'm talking like an hour or two before sunset, or if there is a single cloud in the sky, F9 is going to definitely compromise the autofocusing ability of the camera system. And Blaine said it's weird. But uh, yeah, Bob, very excellent point. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. It's weird nobody talks about the Panasonic 100 to 400 with smoother zoom ring and teleconverter compatibility while staying the same size as the original. Yeah, uh, one of the members in our photo club has that lens on her OM-1. And I saw some of the images she took yesterday because we all went to the same place and they're awesome. So optically, I don't see any challenges with that lens. And it is a very compact, 
I've heard some rumblings that there's some incompatibility or issue using that lens on OM systems. But I can't I can't point my finger to that specific thing, right? Uh, and it may be it may be just not true at all. Could be user error, right? I don't know. Uh, but that lens is a little tempting. If I didn't have the 300 f4 already, uh, I might I might consider that lens anyway. That's a more comfortable range, size, weight for micro four thirds to me than that 150 to 600. So, but yeah, that's, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm really getting into Panasonic now. I mean, this is, I think this is the only Panasonic camera I have, uh, but I've had others. I've had the S5, the S1R, um, the GX85. Uh, they're all gone now. Uh, not because the cameras weren't good, but just, I, I had, I had to pare down. And then I made the mistake of, of building my system crap back up. I got this Fujifilm system and I flushed out the lenses, everything I'd want for that camera system. And I never use it. You know, the X, X-H2 with the 33, the 56, the 28, the or the 23. And, um, you know, all F1.4s, right? All the good stuff. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this, I did not, I made the mistake of buying the A7R5, but I did not make the mistake of flushing out the lens systems for it. The only two lenses I've bought for it are the 55 millimeter 1.8, which I bought used, the Zeiss. Uh, I paid 420, 30, I forget, I paid a little over 400 bucks for it. And then the 28 to 60 kit lens. That's it. And I got the kit lens for 225 bucks, uh, brand new. So I'm not, I'm not buying any more lenses. I, if, if manufacturers want to send me like Viltrox or, uh, TT artisans, they, they're going to send me lenses to review. I'll do that, but I'm not flushing out the lenses on that camera system. Uh, cause I'm just not going to use it, you know? Um, and 28 to 60 is fine. <laughs> you know, that little the little kit lens, where is it? This kit lens, man, this kit lens is awesome. <laughs> I love this little kit lens, 28 to 60, and the images are pretty sharp. And I have my lens, I put a lens hood on it. Ironically, this is the lens hood I used on my Sony NEX6 uh, with its 16 to 50 kit lens. But this is this is not a bad uh, little setup. It's still big, heavy, bulky, yada yada. I mean, it's just it's it's not it's not a micro four thirds camera by any means. I'd much rather take out honestly my LX five than my Sony with that kit lens. Uh, this is what I did yesterday. I took this camera out with my Olympus three hundred f four. For the birding thing so i'll be birding with the the om system and then when i want to take a snapshot like of all the other photographers and in the, the photo club i'll just whip this out it's just hanging just hanging around my neck it's so tiny my god it weighs nothing i'm like whip whip you know <laughs> anyway <laughs> this is a cool it's a cool little uh panasonic is strong yeah one day I'm I'm seriously uh I, I seriously want to get the Panasonic S1R back. I miss that camera. The L mount L mount really they have the best full frame lenses in my opinion relative to price, right? You can certainly get excellent lenses on any camera system, but you know, for right now the 50 millimeter F18 is on sale for 350 bucks. And that lens is, I mean, optically as good as any lens, in my opinion, because uh, it can resolve the whole 47 megapixels of that S1R. Because when I had that that system, it was awesome. I was so happy with the images I got from that camera. It didn't autofocus well. Uh, you know, the the animal tracking and all that wasn't great, 
and that's part of the reason I got rid of it. Uh, the other part was it was just too big and heavy. Uh, but now, now that I'm stuck with this A7R5, I'm I'm starting to get used to this heavy ass, you know, gear. Uh, but I'm not flushing out lenses for the, that system. In the Fuji, I flushed out too many lenses. I I got to think about selling all this stuff. Maybe I don't know. The TZ camera, yeah, definitely. A little one inch, like the TZ two hundred, the Panasonic TZ two hundred uh, has a one inch sensor, has optically a very fast lens. I think it's like two eight to three something. It's really amazing. Um, the problem with the TZ series, it doesn't have the tilt screen. That's that's why I really like this XZ2 is because of this. Getting down low for shots, this is the best. And that's that's the that's the biggest problem I have with this camera is it doesn't tilt. It's just flush. I guess that's what makes it so compact though, right? But anyway, um <laughs> that's your whip. <laughs> TG so I have the TG5. Optically, the LX5 has a better lens than the TG5. I did compare these side by side, you know, raw. But once you process them in DxO, DxO is kind of like the great equalizer of cameras. Once you process them in DxO, the X, the TG5 and the LX5 are very, very comparable in terms of overall image quality. Uh, but straight out of camera, the lens on this is better than the TG5. Uh, no question. No question this is a better lens. Yeah, the 18 to 50. Um, I was tempted by that because I want to get the 18 millimeter, which is a 28 millimeter equivalent. That's kind of the only gap that I have. But I have the uh, kit lens, the 18 to 55 f2.8. And that's the only reason I'm not getting this 18 to 50 is because I have the kit lens. Um, I, um, I, you know, I, I have my halo lens, the 33 1.4. I always want to have at least one halo lens, but all the lenses surrounding that don't have to be as good as like this 18 to 50 to eight. Uh, but it was tempting. I was thinking about trading my 18 to 55 Fuji to get that lens. But then I was like, why? I don't need a constant f2.8 for anything. It would be great if I was doing events and things. If, like if I was using that camera professionally, I would probably do that, get the 18 to 52 8. But I don't see. Um, I, I I just don't have a need for for that lens. Oh, Ron's gone. Sorry, Ron. Hey, you know, if you guys want to talk about anything, if I'm boring you to death, just just leave it in the comment. <laughs> just say, Ron, let's stop talking about these little compact cameras or stop talking about whatever. You know, talk about something else. I'm fine with that. I'll talk about anything photography late. I only got about five minutes left, but uh, yeah, Ron, sorry about that. I get it, though. You know, I'm not, you know... Everyone has their own voice and own own sort of audience, right? Like, if you're friends with everybody, you're you're not going to make anybody happy, right? Uh, it's one of those things. So I'm sure many of you just love sitting here talking to me and chatting or listening to me talk, I should say. And others are going to be bored to tears, like Ron. I get it, you know. Trust me, there's people that are extremely popular on YouTube that just bore me to tears. I just cannot watch them. I don't want to say any names because I don't want to say anything bad about anybody. Just because they're boring to me doesn't mean they're boring and stupid to you, right? Uh, you might love their channel. Like, um, <clears throat> you know, Casey, a camera conspiracy. I love his channel, but some people can't stand him, you know, but I love it. Some people hate the fro, but I love the fro. You know, it's kind of like, kind of like that, right? So it's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I bored you to tears. Hopefully this wasn't your first time here. If you've been to my streams many times, then all of a sudden my streams are really boring. That's a different conversation, right? <clears throat> that means something's changed about me. 
uh, only have use for the TG's rug in this underwater kit. Yeah, definitely. And then Robin, Robin says, no, Rob, you're nothing but boring. Hundreds of thousands of people tune in every week to watch your video, including me. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. I appreciate it. But you have, you have dominated the live stream space, I think. You know, your live streams are so engaging and you 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 have such a, a great following to your live streams. I mean, the number of views you get on your live streams is indicative of that. But uh, even if you didn't get the same number of views, let's say you're more similar in line with mine, uh, the 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 number of questions you answer and and the number of people that you engage with in five minutes is amazing. <laughs> I'm lucky to get to a handful of people in a stream and answer any questions. Uh, and then even even getting information out about anything, right? <laughs> like talking about anything, it's 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 very incoherent sometimes and disjointed. And I I you know I don't know if anybody knows what the heck I'm talking about or what my point is half the time. Even today, I just turned the stream on 30 minutes before I decided to go live because I wasn't planning on going live today. But I was like, you know what? Every week, I just turn the camera on and just start talking. I never plan. It's really rare. But uh, um, one of these days, I'll have to I'll have to come up and actually script out a, a stream. But then, if I'm going to do that, I might, might as well make a video. I don't know. Not a big fan of uh, fixed lenses, lens cameras. Uh, manufacturer bring out more 1.8 weather sealed pancakes. You know, an interesting lens I found uh, yesterday was the 25 millimeter f2.8 pancake lens for the four thirds system. You know, like the the E series uh, four third cameras. So I looked that up and they want like 150 bucks for that lens. And I'm like, are you serious? 150 bucks for that old, old lens. Some wanted 200. Crazy. Oh, thank you, Lysippus. I appreciate that. That wood duck did come out. That was my favorite. Definitely more pancake lenses, though. I would love to see them. I would love to see more pancakes. You know, I get it. There's going to be compromises on image quality or autofocus performance, there, there's going to be a compromise with a pancake lens. But I'm willing to accept that to have a pancake lens sometimes. Long as it's autofocus, I, I, you know, because there's plenty of small lenses that are manual focus. Um, yeah, I know what you mean, Kostov. You mean, you mean cameras like this, right? Like this, this thing where you can't, it's not interchangeable. That's why Robin chugs coffee during his streams. I know, right? Uh, Rob Robin Wong is awesome, and I I really I really like I really like the the group that we get together every year. Everyone has such awesome channels and content, and I I don't know. I need to I need to start making some regular videos. I problem is it's tax season right now, so I got to work on my taxes, and then I got. All these products coming in now it's getting warm, thank goodness, but man, all these products came in the winter time that I have to do reviews on. I got one almost finished, and I got another one I gotta start, and then I got more stuff coming in, so I need to think of a way to make the videos relevant, even if the products weren't you know given to me right so uh like take away the fact that they gave me this lens or this lighting product. Would you watch the video, right? Like, is the video going to be relevant? Am I showing you something new, right? Photographically or sharing with you, like, how, how did I take this image using this particular product? I don't know. You know, that like the, the product review, you, review that I did on the extension arm, I thought was awesome. Because it's not a high-end product, right? It's like a $60 product. It's not like... Uh, they paid me to do that. They just gave me the extension arm. But I, I took that because I thought that was a great product that a lot of people could use in their photography um, and that it is better than the tripods. So that's why I kind of accepted that product, even though it's not a high dollar value product. Um, and not a lot of people watch that video, but I think, I think 
definitely if if you if you want to expand your photography in the macro and doing other types of studio type work a tripod extension arm is really very very useful and it's not much it's like 60 bucks and there's a 10 percent code or something too so it's like 53 dollars for that uh but i have some other products that if i do the review with the typical you know these are the features this is the build quality and here's a couple things you can do with it like a 10 minute review video it wouldn't it's not going to be that interesting if you're not interested in whatever that product is right like who cares who cares about this product you know what i want to know is how is this product going to help me in my photography so um, I, I have this one review almost done, and I'm trying to think, do I add another five or 10 minutes to the video to show you how to use the product and how it's gonna improve your photography? Or do I make a separate video to do that? So I'm, I'm a little bit torn. Uh, so anyway, I have a review coming out in a couple of days for a new product, and then I have another product which definitely will improve your photography if you like to do studio work uh that's coming uh so there's some there's some things i'm 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 really torn uh because i could do i could do reviews on stuff that i actually buy right like this lx5 these these are certainly popular videos if they're done right you know robin wong does a lot of these right where he takes these old cameras and photo walks with them he does a good job with that. Uh, if you get a LX5, Robin, you should do a review on this, like a photo walk with this. You'll be amazed. It's really a great camera. Um, but anyhow, um, I think, oh, you think I should do shorts, huh? I mean, let me get to the last couple of, of, of comments here. Um, I like my X100V with fixed lens. It adds something to the experience of going out and shooting. Occasionally, you have to do a little crop and post. Yeah. Yeah, I try to go out with a fixed uh, focal length whenever I go out anyway anymore. I mean, I'll take a zoom out of necessity sometimes. But generally speaking, if I'm going to focus on my photography, I'm fine with a fixed length, length lens. I'd be happy with an X100V. And then Wayne says, you think I should do shorts? Wow. Okay. That's a tough call. Um, short, shorts on how to do things. Interesting. I've seen a few of those. I have to give some thought to that. And then Eric says, to be honest, any video you post, even if it doesn't pertain to me, out of respect of the work you did, I'll watch it to support it. Same with Robin. Micro Four Thirds guy. Yeah. Well, we, we certainly appreciate that. But don't waste your time, right? If, if I'm doing a review on a product that you're never going to have any interest in, I think, I think it's important, though, if, if, I can, if I can make the videos relevant, whether the product is free or not, right? Like if somebody gave me the product relevant to photography, then I think it's definitely worth watching. Uh, so I might do another extension arm video because I didn't really get into all the different uses for the extension arm. Uh, I did give a couple of examples, but I didn't really get into it. Uh, I might have to do another review on the, ex not review, but another video on the extension arm because that is really, really handy. Uh, and I have to give some thought about a couple of the products that I have queued up to review on. I have to give some thought, but oh, you're looking for an LX5. Could not find a used unit in local buy sell market. Yeah, Robin, it's awesome. That LX5, man, I tell you what, man, uh, you got to process it with DXO. The JPEGs out of this aren't particularly interesting, though. They have like nostalgia standard. I'm going to try dynamic today, a different JPEG profile they have, and see what that looks like. I haven't been impressed with the JPEGs on this, uh, but the the raw images process and DxO are just outstanding, really outstanding. And this lens is really impressive. I love the little step zoom. I can go from 24 to 28 to you know 50 to 70 to 90 just by one click like this. Zip zip zip. <laughs> I love that. 
because I like I like consistency in my photography. I'm shooting at 28 millimeters today. I'm shooting at 50 millimeters today. Like my TG5 and my XZ2, it's hard to get in the exact zoom that I want or focal length that I want. I get it. What does it matter? Just zoom into what you need to frame the subject, right? But I, my brain is like, I want, I want a fixed number. I'm going to shoot at this. I'm going to shoot at this. But anyhow, uh, I think I've looked at both. DxO is so much better than Topaz that I need to replace what I have. I don't know, Adam. I. I would say just download download the trial and see. Uh, like download the Photolab 7 trial, and I have a video on how to use it a little bit. And there's lots of other tutorials. Uh, maybe watch the tutorials before you download the trial. But you got to try it for yourself and see. I haven't tried the latest Topaz products. But when I did compare them, DxO was giving me better results. Um, short. Why do you need an extension arm? It just makes it just makes doing certain types of photography easier, right? Macro photography, in particular, uh, product photography, so you can get your camera overhead. Because <clears throat> they have those tripods that have the articulating arms, but they're too short. They're too short. The extension arm really lets you get your camera or lighting way out there to exactly where you need it to be. And it's much easier to work with in the field. The workflow is a lot smoother. So I'll have, to, you know, if you watch my video on the extension arm, I kind of go over all those points, but I, I don't do enough examples or real world use of the extension arm. And I need to do more of that. But I, I have to go, everybody. I'm going out to do that birding thing. And I'll post some pictures of the birds uh, if, you know, if they come out any good uh, on the community page. And of course, on my Flickr and Instagram. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here today. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys again uh, next week.